good morning. And um, thank you for having me here today uh, with the honour to present to you. Um, and I'd like to thank John Louis for um, giving a great presentation and setting up um, uh, the stage for me to talk about um, how the practical implementation uh, of Q12. And really, um, we all feel in the expert working group that the, the hard work really does start now. So the presentation will be structured as so. Um, I'll ask a few questions about Q12, uh, give some background. Uh, I'll not do too much there because Jean-Louis already covered that. Um, then I'll give some examples as to how AstraZeneca has implemented um, Q12. And I'll do that through some of the work that we've done with FDA in their established conditions pilot. And then I'll cover some uh, uh, work also around how um, health authorities may um, implement Q12 and the challenges there. So I'm sure you've seen many slides like this uh, in the past. And it's, uh, it's really an illustration of the activity that happens across a product's life cycle, right from the clinical uh, pharmaceutical development of a product, uh, where we understand, start to understand the product uh, to begin with, technology transfer, commercial manufacture, and product discontinuation. And throughout that period, there are um, site transfers, changes the process, product understanding, um, and a whole evolution of the control strategy. So these are essential things that uh, drive change, drive improvement, um, which are all expected of the pharmaceutical industry as written in Q10. What we're also seeing at the moment, uh, and this is becoming more and more prevalent, is that drug development is accelerating. This is through uh, much faster clinical development um, as targeted therapies and disease understanding grows. And we're seeing this um, much more in the um, oncology area. We're obviously seeing it in the COVID um, scenario at the minute where some uh, vaccines uh, and therapies are being developed at incredible speeds. But this is putting uh, a real change in terms of the speed um, and, uh, and context of uh, the CMC development that has to go along with that. And instead of the sort of 12 years or so that we had to do CMC development to support uh, the structured phase one, phase two, phase three programs, that is being compressed uh, into uh, anywhere from uh, six to seven years down to uh, nowadays um, with the COVID therapies, a year. And what that means is that more and more development um, and enhancement of the products is happening in the commercial space. So much larger changes over a wider period of time is happening in that space. And clinical development goes on throughout the product's life cycle. It's not finished when we get the first indication. And you can see some of the uh, uh, examples that I shared on the slide. Now, how are we going to deliver those changes? Expand the capacity of those drugs uh, and ensure we have um, high quality uh, drug available to patients globally uh, as fast as possible. There's a problem. If you look at this um, picture, and I um, uh, need to recognize Anders Winter and uh, Erika Ramari, um, from a regulator's perspective, they see a change from a company come to them 
be reviewed, questions asked, and if acceptable, approved. It's relatively straightforward. But from a company perspective, we then do that for every regulator around the world. They may have different requirements. They may have different um, review timelines. Um, and there may be a different outcome as a consequence of that. That ultimately leads to, uh, and some of these uh, require approval by a stringent regulatory authority before they will even start uh, to review uh, the change. So this can lead to around four years um, to implement major changes across the globe. It can also result in fragmentation of the supply chain, which can lead to shortages in some regions. And this is something that we need to deal with. Everyone needs to deal with. So I'll touch on uh, some background. So fortunately, we do have great uh, Q12. Um, and that's a great opportunity for patients and industry. It provides a risk-based framework, hopefully a predictable and efficient um, uh, post-approval changes, harmonized regulatory tools and enablers, and it uses uh, product and process knowledge to effect risk-based regulatory oversight with the control strategy of the product, um, a, key, a key element of that driving change, not just um, standardized uh, changes uh, across the board. So, and, and a core part of that, and, uh, and the new concept that we've brought in with Q12 is established conditions. And these are the legally binding information necessary to assure of product quality. Change reporting categories for EC then become risk-based um, based on the impact to product quality. And these can be negotiated up front with the agency. If things are not defined as established conditions, then changes are only managed within the product quality system. And they are available for inspection. So you can see the diagram that Jean-Louis shared earlier here. Um, so within um, uh, a company, we develop as we develop a product, um, we develop our product knowledge. When we're putting an application together, we will um, uh, grow that dossier uh, and put the relevant product knowledge into that dossier to support the, um, the application. And within that will be the established conditions. So it will not be the whole dossier content, but it will be a subsection of that will be defined as the established conditions. Uh, and this goes along with this um, slide. Now, an important element of here is uh, this part of the um, decision tree. Um, because it is key that uh, companies are able to make changes and not report every change to the authorities if we are able to, to really accelerate innovation uh, and update our products uh, for manufacturing. I'll not go into too much detail on this slide because I know John Louis has shared this. Um, but a key piece I wanted to illustrate here is um, the uh, how the language in uh, the Appendix 1 uh, is used to describe the established conditions. So here, it's not everything about the raw materials, reagents, or solvents that's described as established conditions. It's the critical elements of those uh that are required so it's trying to reduce 
unnecessary um, changes uh, being uh, communicated to health authorities, not to hide anything, but to enable things to move that have limited to no potential impact on product quality uh, and impact on the patient. <clears throat> the post-approval change management protocol, John Louise touched on already, um, and he's outlined a similar um, description of the step one and two uh, outlined here, uh, where we define the strategy, uh, deliver uh, and get that approved. Um, uh, when we're implementing doing the change, we get the results. Uh, submit those results uh, by whatever uh, category is agreed, uh, and then implement the change once that's um, uh, met the regulatory expectations. Um, and this procedure has been available in the US and Europe. Um, so part of the uh, intent of Q12 is obviously to spread the application of this to other regions, um, but also to be able to broaden the applicability and use of the PACMP across a product's life cycle. And to do that, a key element is to be able to modify a PACMP um, such that it can grow with the product. Now, to do that modification, um, it will be important that minor changes can be uh, implemented through the mechanism of a notification. If every time a company has to change a PACMP uh, and have a prior approval change, it will never work. And that's part of the, uh, the broadening aspect that we've tried to implement within Q12. Here is an example that's taken from the uh, annex in Q12, um, where it's a uh, an alternative manufacturing site for a drug substance, a small molecule. Um, and here uh, we would be looking to um, implement this change through a lower reporting category. And in the EU, that would be from maybe a type um, two variation to a type one B. And that would involve a shorter review timeline, allowing uh, quicker implementation. A quality risk management approach is used to assess the, uh, the criteria needed um, uh, to implement that change safely. Um, uh, and these are described here. So an acceptance criteria uh, related to three consecutive batches demonstrating equivalence uh, to the previous um, approved. Other criteria are related to stability data. And in this uh, example, it's proposed that the stability data is confirmatory. So it's not submitted with the change for approval. It's submitted after to confirm that the change was um, successful because stability um, from the risk assessment is considered low risk uh, for this product. And there would be acceptable GMP um, status for the uh, for the facilities, um, and you'll see the uh, similar manufacturing equipment. If all that was uh, appropriately implemented, well, what would be the benefit? Well, in this example, um, uh, at the top is a traditional site transfer. So, a product shipment would happen here. But by means of using a PACMP, it would be possible to implement that change around up to five months earlier. And in relation to the US, where typically um, drug substance stability data is required before the um, change is implemented. This could bring the change even further, a further six months earlier uh, in this circumstance. So it can have a huge benefit. And in this case, 
where you're able to plan the PACMP ahead of being able to uh, do the site transfer, you can do you can potentially do it in parallel. So you're gaining time, um, and it's predictability. John has already showed you the um, uh, an example uh, from the um, Q12 team of a product a lifecycle management document. And really, as, as described, it connects uh, the tools in Q12. So it, uh, it relates the proposed established conditions for the product, the reporting categories. Uh, it will include uh, the PACMPs, um, if there are any, and also any post-approval CMC commitments. And this not only provides clarity between the uh, marketing authorization holder and the regulatory authority, but also within um, the, the company itself. So between technical groups, regulatory groups, and quality organizations. And that can be hugely beneficial. And also within the regulatory authorities, this is talking about reviewers and inspectors and compliance uh, groups within there. So there's a great benefit in having that clarity as to what is actually required to be communicated to the health authority. So how is AZ um, implemented Q12? Well, we're on our journey, um, just like any company and, and health authority. Um, and, uh, and to help us on this journey, we participated in the US FDA's pilot program uh, on um, implementing established conditions. When we thought about it, we had a choice, which product would we choose? And given that this is a new concept, um, and we anticipated that there may need to be um, the dialogue, uh, an enhanced dialogue between AstraZeneca and FDA, we were um, cautious about um, implementing this on a new product. And in the end, we decided on implementing uh, with regards to a, an already commercialized product. And you can see the risk assessment that we went through uh, in understanding what the potential impact could be on that product by bringing it through um, the pilot. So we were, we wanted to go into this with our, uh, with our eyes fully open uh, and understand how we could uh, gain benefit, but not risk um, uh, the product itself and, and supply to patients. And this is a, a clinically essential product. Um, we also considered the, um, the benefits of this. So this is a growing product and we felt that um, applying established conditions even in the context of the US would be hugely beneficial uh, to changes that were likely to arise within the supply chain in the future. So how did we think about putting this together? Um, Given that it was all an already marketed product, we'd already submitted much of the supportive information in the original NDA, but it wasn't formatted in uh, a way that would directly support the established conditions that, um, that we may want to uh, provide. So we essentially um, uh, set out an introduction uh, and redefined uh, and repositioned uh, our risk assessments uh, underpinning the product uh, and, and showing the overall uh, risk uh, of quality um, with regards to the supply, uh, the control strategy uh, for, for the product, thinking about its chemical, uh, physiochemical properties and biopharmaceutical properties. And doing that helped us consider what the most relevant aspects of control were to assure the quality of the product, and then focus in on what we felt would be relevant established conditions. 
Now, this is just a summary, and I'll go into um, some of the details uh, in later slides. But this is um, uh, a visual representation of the proposed control strategy for the drug substance. And also, we, we looked to describe some of the stability considerations that may uh, enable faster implementation of changes for what was a relatively stable product. We then considered putting this together in a tabular format to more closely link the justifications um, for uh, the established conditions uh, and cross-reference that to the original application itself. And excuse my dogs if you can hear them barking in the background. <clears throat> With this product, um, we sort of assess the potential impact to the patient looking at, at several factors. Um, the drug product, uh, drug substance process had shown to produce well controlled drug substance. We'd manufactured at least 100 batches uh, at this point, and by now, probably closer to 150 batches of the product. And the drug substance quality was always relatively consistent and certainly within the um, specification. The stability of the drug substance had been demonstrated to be excellent. There was a low biopharmaceutical um, risk uh, to the drug product, so potentially changes to the drug substance may, would have limited impact uh, on drug product. And the capability of the process to purge impurities was very high. So the established conditions in this instance were um, uh, weighted towards ensuring that the synthetic root of the product including the starting materials and intermediates were maintained, uh, thus maintaining the purge capability of the process. And also that the impurities with potential to persist in the drug substance were controlled adequately and at the right stage in the manufacturing process. We use the decision tree that's described in, the, in chapter three um, within Q12 to, um, to consider all the manufacturing process and controls um, uh, for the drug substance. And in, in the decision tree itself, it talks primarily, it talks directly to process parameters, but the intent of the Q12 expert working group was that the, the principles outlined in this would be applicable when assessing established conditions um, for any product um, uh, and the, uh, the controls associated with it. From this, um, and I've, uh, I've alluded to it in earlier slides, we identified the synthetic route, the risk uh, posed by changes to the synthetic route would be high. Changes to the process upstream, so close to the API, would be moderate. Um, but the earlier stages uh, in the synthesis would have a low risk to impact the um, drug substance quality due to the, per the ability to purge impurities well and our understanding of the process. Input materials, uh, depending upon what they were, um, had a moderate to low um, impact on drug substance. And the in-process in controls generally were there for the purposes of efficiency um, and generally had a low level of impact on the, uh, on the drug substance quality. And it was mainly to reduce waste. So this is the uh, pictorial uh, representation of the established conditions. Um, uh, and this is just to illustrate some of the things I said on the previous slide. So as we build, um, this aspect of the process has a, a lower risk to impacting the quality of the drug substance. 
you can see that the specification for starting material one um, just talks about a specific impurity and any individual unspecified impurities. So it's not a complete specification that's called out here. It's only those things that have the potential to impact drug substance quality. We pull out again for intermediates, the important aspect of control with regards to this isolated intermediate, three steps from the um, API uh, stage, is a residual catalyst um, that is controlled at this point. All other impurities in here uh, are readily purged um, and there are controls at this point for, uh, for others. We've identified an IPC, only one. There are other IPCs here, but again, they're only for efficiencies. This is a key control to ensure the quality of the product downstream. And this is an important specification um, for uh, this uh, uh, pure minus one uh, intermediate here. And finally, uh, there's a CPP around contributory the solution strength for this uh, non-contributory uh, reagent uh, addition. So this is uh, illustrated here uh, in terms of uh, a description of the, um, the process element, the potential uh, impacted CQAs, uh, and the change classification and the, uh, and the justification here. And in this regard, this is the kind of information that would be included in the PLCM document. Similarly here, um, we're, we're um, looking at uh, process parameters for, for the early steps. Um, could potentially impact the uh, impurities, CQA, in the drug substance. And that is considered an annual reportable change. And on the previous slide, for the, uh, for the later steps, this was considered a CBE 30. So you can see the different classification levels. This is higher because it's closer to the drug substance, and we've seen more potential for impact whereas here it's an annual report. And again, this is the kind of information that would be included in the PLCM document. With regards to the stability risk assessment um, and, uh, and consequent uh, commitments, we've rated these against the change classification. So the only prior approval change that we have uh, is really in relation to changes of the synthetic wood. And in those um, circumstances, we would design a stability study um, to deliver uh, data um, that would be submitted as part of the application. It may not be a standard stability package because we already know that this drug substance is highly stable. Um, so it may be a reduced stability package or using um, uh, accelerated um, uh, stability approaches uh, to be able to implement this change quicker. But as this would be submitted as a PAS, there would be an opportunity for the um, health authority to review that and if they were unhappy with the stability data provided, they could ask for more. For changes that are moderate risk, and in this circumstance, it would mean changes that had uh, a lower, moderate uh, likelihood of impacting the impurity profile of the drug substance, then we would only do confirmatory stability studies, i.e. Uh, we would do studies um, but we would implement the change if approved before providing the stability to study uh, data to the health authority. And that would uh, increase the speed of that change. 
for um, moderate to low changes and low changes, there would be no proposed stability data uh, to affect that change. And these were all, these are what I'm showing you are um, change classifications uh, that have been approved by the FDA. This is not theoretical. This is what they actually approved. So as part of that, we had three rounds of questions uh, and a teleconference. FDA focused a lot on the PQS system and how change would be done. Uh, very interested in if you did this, how would you know? Um, uh, and we explained um, things like how our approach to analytical method capability uh, would be um, approached uh, if there were concerns that impurities wouldn't be detected. So we went through quite, uh, quite a lot of um, discussion around um, the change approaches. We weren't asked to put any of that PQS information in the dossier, which was a, a really important um, element. And FDA agreed to um, pretty much all the proposals we made. Uh, we had proposed that a site change for API um, uh, be made as a CBE zero, which would have mean, meant um, immediate implementation upon submission of the change. But FDA requested that we reduce, uh, increase that to a CBE 30. And they wanted that 30 day, that gives FDA 30 days to review the change um, before you can implement. And they wanted to use that time to be able to do the site risk assessment with regards to its compliance state, status. And we got the, um, the approval on the 20th of December with no post-marketing commitments. So how has it helped? We've only got approval uh, in a single country um, for this change, but it has enabled us to make a uh, site change for uh, this clinically um, uh, essential medicine uh, much quicker using the confirmatory stability data approach rather than uh, waiting for that stability data in the application. And that was incredibly important for the supply chain for that product. Several changes have been progressed with immediate, um, without reporting, uh, because they were defined as um, uh, not as established conditions, uh, as agreed in the PLCM. Uh, so we've been able to really simplify some of the change approaches uh, that we've done. We've also changed, simplified the addition of um, uh, starting material manufacturers as part of that, um, uh, the established conditions agreed in the PLCM. And in doing that, we've not seen any change and any uh, reduction in the performance of the uh, production and quality of the drug substance. The drug substance is still being manufactured in line with our PQS. We're still managing uh, the information. Um, it's still being monitored by AZ. Um, this drug is, is manufactured as a, at a contract search organization. Um, but the quality of the drug has not been affected as a consequence of having um, much more freedom to make changes than we had before. And I think this is key. Um, John Louis has gone through this, but the change management, understanding that every change goes through the change management process, that even if it's done at a CMO, the company, the MAH, has oversight of that change. And it's only changes that are related to established conditions that either need to be approved or notified to the health authorities. And I think, as, as you've seen in our example, it's critical that reviewers understand the role of the PQS and also their inspectorates and other inspectorates in surveillance of, and I use this, uh, this term in, uh, in inverted commas, uh, effectiveness of the PQS. 
there's a lot of talk about sort of how do we demonstrate uh, effectiveness of the PQS, how do agencies share information about the uh, inspections that they've done of facilities. But this is critical. If we don't improve this, then it will be a real impediment to the implementation of Q12. What about health authority implementation of Q12? Well, in Europe, we've been uh, having dialogue, not just with the, um, uh, the expert working group representatives in Q12, but also with the European Commission, um, who uh, oversee the, um, uh, the legal framework in Europe um, and are uh, responsible for that. Uh, FPA, the Trade Association, has written uh, white papers, shared those with the Commission, and we've had um, two meetings uh, with them uh, in terms of how um, Q12 relates to the legal framework and, um, uh, and how we may be able to implement that. And we recognise that changing uh, the regulatory framework in Europe is a complex thing. It's uh, a body made up of, uh, of 27 states. Um, so changes to law aren't easy generally. Um, they're even more difficult in, in that uh, type of situation. But they understood the rationale um, for changes to the regulation, recognised the areas that we identified uh, for improvement, and the, those areas are shared um, with regulators in the, uh, in the EU network, and they do support implementation of Q12. Uh, the challenge is when uh, and doing that through the, uh, the processes to change uh, uh, laws in Europe. But what about elsewhere? Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate to be speaking to you uh, this morning. Um, so we initiated a project um, within FPA, within our international regulatory expert group, to understand what are the challenges that other countries would experience in implementing Q12. And you can see some of the topics that we touched on there. Um, uh, we looked at um, ICH members and also uh, observers uh, to see the, uh, the challenges, uh, the different challenges they may face. In regards to this, you see the members are in orange and the observers are illustrated in blue. And I'll focus on, on the members given I'm, I'm speaking to a, a Korean audience. Um, Key, key pieces here are um, uh, capability, capacity, long and predicted timelines, um, and clarity in, um, on requirements, and additional local requirements, or limited or, or no classification. So that's, that's factors impacting the post-approval system. Barriers to implementation uh, of Q12 are, uh, as you can see, and a key piece here is training of regulatory and industry, which is one of the reasons why uh, I'm so pleased to be talking to you today. There's obviously the element of inclusion of Q12 principles within the framework um, and also uh, maturity of the regulatory system. And how far is, uh, is Q8 uh, to 11 implemented? And this is important because it's, uh, it's, it's required for um, full implementation of Q12. It's not necessary um, uh, to implement Q12, but to get the full benefit, uh, it is important. Um, and there's po typically partial implementation uh, in the newer ICH members. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to see that there's a session on uh, Q8 to 11 on the agenda after me. So conclusions from this are, um, it is an industry view only. So the regulators in the audience may have a different view. Um, but the results do show some of the challenges. Um, that, are, that exist to implement Q12 
um, both within ICH members and in non-ICH members. There is intent to implement um, within the ICH members, um, but there are some challenges there. Some members don't have classification of changes. The laws may need to be changed, regulations. There will need to be capacity building and training and industry is keen to have a role in supporting this. Um, and it's worth recognizing that implementation is ongoing in, uh, in the uh, originating ICH members as well. Um, FDA is from a pilot, um, uh, etc. So um, it's going to take time. But I think the key thing here is industry is keen to partner with health authorities um, uh, to go on this journey. So a provocative question. Is Q12 sufficient to resolve the problem? Can we move to real-time post-approval changes? Um, or how do we get from years or weeks uh, to weeks uh, in terms of implementing changes? And I'm just uh, illustrating this with the, uh, with the diagram I showed, the picture I showed earlier. I think a key thing here is Q12 isn't going to fully solve this problem. It will go a long way to making it a lot better. But really, when you look at, uh, at this uh, diagram here uh, on the bottom left, it's clear that we need to use more reliance and recognition uh, uh, approaches to reduce the number of times that post-approval changes are reviewed globally. If we have a change reviewed a hundred times, it's going to take much longer. It's going to cause problems. It's inevitable. And it's really uh, exciting um, to see uh, the white paper sponsored by FDA and HPRA um, covering review and an inspection. Um, looking at reliance mechanisms, both in the, um, in the review end of things and also how to share facility compliance information. So I'll leave you with this. Uh, this is beyond the scope of Q12, but I think absolutely critical if we want to ensure that patients get the medicines they need when they need them at the quality they need. And thank you. And I'd just like to thank these people, obviously the whole of the IWG, um, but in particular, my colleagues in FBA, Graham Cook, Marcus Gouze, um, George France, um, Jean-Louis, uh, and also Andrew Chang, who I've uh, stolen some of the slides. Stuart Finney helped me put the presentation together, and Andrew Davin um, led the effort from uh, the FBI Ray group. And I'll now take questions. Thank you.